I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, we're exploring the thrilling adventure of Bad Cat Jones, former slave's pioneering journey west. It's written by an amazing author by the name of Danny Ray Arnold. This captivating tale chronicles the perilous journey of former slaves seeking a better life in Colorado after the Civil War. Join us right now as we uncover their extraordinary determination, bravery, and grit in the face of countless dangers. We're delighted to have this very talented author join us here today on Spotlight. We thank the team at Bookside Press for helping us put him in the spotlight today. And we ask viewers like you to support authors like him by subscribing to our channel and by purchasing his amazing book. The links are below this interview. Danny, great to see you here today on Spotlight. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm really glad to be here. What inspired you to write about the journey of former slaves and Bad Cat Jones? Well, I have to go back maybe 25 years or so. Uh, I was raised on a plantation in Louisiana. It was really a pecan plantation or pecans as some people say, but we had cattle and, and uh, cotton and soybeans. And oh gosh, we had those small bales of hay, the boy killing bales, and that's what we did back then. But most of the people uh, at that, that I worked with were African-American. Mm -hmm. And that's who I grew up with. That's who I worked with and, and so forth. And then later in life, I, I, I connected a couple of dots. I, I read about the, uh, well, the, one, one dot was that about a third or so of the cowboys uh, out West were in fact black. And I, you know, that was very interesting to me because that's not the way it was in the movies. And, uh, so that, that was a big one. And then I read about uh, toward the end of the Civil War and after, and, and right at the end of it, there were a number of planters who literally, they knew what was about to happen. The South was going to lose the war. Slavery was uh, abolished. And so they just picked up and moved all their property, including the enslaved people, west, like in the East Texas and, and a little bit further. And so all that kind of, got in my mind and I thought, you know, the, the people I grew up working with, they could have done that. They could have taken a journey west. Uh, uh, and so the story started percolating in, in my mind. And uh, I mean, so my, some friends say, yeah, I remember you talking about that 25 years ago <laughs> and my wife included, by the way. Yeah. So, uh, you know, when, when we drive, you know, I, that's just something I would think about. I would just think of scenes. What kind of stuff would they have run into? What kind of trials and tribulations would they have faced, you know, going west as a, a caravan of, of African-Americans? Of course, that wasn't a term back then. And it was colored. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I retired three times. And my wife started nudging me about, well, why don't you just write this book? And, uh, well, then COVID hit. And I said, all right, let me sit down and write this book. Mm -hmm. And so I started writing it. The first half was easy because I had already thought about it. And then I had to learn how to write stuff I hadn't thought about before. Uh, but I, I just I just thought it was an interesting story and one that I had not read. I read a lot of Westerns in my life, as, as you would expect. I had never read about the slaves going west. Oh, I, I missed one thing. Another thing I, I did read about was that there were actually African-American communities in some, some in Texas, more in Oklahoma, and even more in Kansas. The only people that lived there were the African-Americans. And I actually ran into a lady at one of the Western Writers conferences that lives today in one of those little towns that, that survived. Uh, so again, I just put all that together and a, a story just grew from that. Amazing, amazing. Well, we're glad that COVID hit just so you could write this book. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> but it is amazing. A lot of people did put uh, their COVID lockdowns to good use, and you did as well with writing this book. Um, and you're, it's true. You don't hear much about African-American cowboys or pioneers. And uh, right. as you say, they made up one third of the, um, of the cowboys. And 
we don't see that. It's only John Wayne and, you know, Gary Cooper, right. um, you know. Right. But uh, So I'm glad that you uh, are shedding light on the story. Give us an overview of the story, Bad Cat Jones, the character and his uh, unique relationship with Cletus Sheffield and so forth. Okay. Uh, all right, I have to start back, and I had to give some background in the book, because mm -hmm. when the book started, uh, Bad Cat Jones was in his early 20s. Okay, now where did he come from? And so what we created is uh, technically he was a slave. His mother and he were bought when Bad Cat or Cat was a very young man. Uh, uh, he's a toddler, like two. And uh, his mother was really bought to be the nanny to the youngest son of a planter. Uh, his name was Cletus, Cletus Sheffield. So she had to live in the house. Well, and Cat actually grew up in the big plantation home. Yes, he was a slave, but his experience was a little bit different. So Cat and Cletus, Cletus the planter's son, they, they were the best of friends because Cletus didn't have anybody else around to play with. So they grew up playing and learning and, and stuff like that. And one of the one of the important things that might not seem important when you first read it is they they had a foreman relatively new and he happened to be a mean man and one of the adult slaves ran away and they caught him and when they brought him back uh he beat him with a whip and the two young boys they were about eight if i remember right and they were just absolutely appalled that somebody would do that to another human being and so they promised to protect each other the rest of their lives mm. <laughs> which turned out to be a big thing for, for both of them. So, then I won't get off on what happened to that guy, but he didn't make it, as it turned out, the, the guy with a whip, but that's another part of the story. But these these two uh, young men, you know, when they got up old enough, you know, preteens and what have you, you know, they ran in the woods and they hunted and they fished and they got two Choctaw friends, the two young boys, that they're the same age, brothers, and they taught each other out the four boys. So you had two Indians, uh, a young African-American boy and a white boy. And so they taught each other things, like woodcraft, shooting a bow and arrow, uh, Choctaw wrestling. And uh, then they helped the Choctaws with the English and all kinds of things. And Cat, I mean, uh, Cletus also uh, recognized uh, when he got his tutor that uh, the slaves, they didn't want the slaves learning how to read and write. Mm. And he thought that was terrible. So he would, his tutor would work with him in the morning and then he would work with Cat <laughs> at night. So Cat learned how to read and write. Uh, Cat had some unusual talents as he, as he grew up. He was a, a tremendous athlete. Uh, he could imitate any sound in the forest. Uh, you know, the owls and uh, panthers cry, hunting cry, and all kinds of things like that. Uh, so when the, the two boys got to be about 16, the planter wanted Cletus to go to Europe for his education. So Cat went with him. So again, they're 16, they're nearly men, and uh, they have all kinds of adventures there. They spent a year in, uh, in London, and they got into, uh, and, and again, he was teaching Cat what he had learned during the day. Uh, they, they got into the English boxing at the time, uh, as a pastime. And uh, then the, the second year, they, they went to, uh, to France, and they got into English kickboxing. I mean, uh, football? Uh, French kickboxing, excuse me. French kickboxing. Boxing. And uh, had some adventures there and then went into Spain. And I thought it was fascinating doing the research that Muay Thai, which come from the Far East, mm -hmm. was actually very popular in Spain and Portugal. So they picked huh. that. So that all helped make made him a, a lethal person. So when he got up to about 19, the Civil War broke out. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Cletus and Cap came back. And uh, Cletus joined up since he had college education. He was an officer. 
And one of the little things that a lot of people aren't aware of, in the Civil War, many of the Southern officers uh, had a slave that was their gopher for the whole, the whole squad, for example. Scrounger, they'd scrounge up stuff and what have you. And Cat actually did that during the war. Chief Cook model washer. And he was uh, Cletus's protector. Dad himself wouldn't fight unless Cletus was in danger. And uh, every time he got into danger, then Cap pulled the robe off and put the robe over the cape and uh, did what he could to save Cletus. And he developed into such a well-known person among the soldiers and everything that they added the moniker bad to his name, Bad Cat Jones. Gotcha. And uh, so when the war was, oh, by the way, Cletus was a sniper also. And uh, so every time he went out on a sniping mission, uh, Cap was his shadow and protector. That's what the second does. So right at the end of the war, there was about a week left. And they were, the squad was in North Louisiana, but not, not that far from uh, the, the Sheffield Plantation where they both grew up. And uh, so one morning, they're by a little bayou, and of course, cat's up, so there's the first light, and he goes to get water to make coffee. The rest of them are asleep. Well, a Yank squad was waiting on light, and they were right outside the, the camp. So they captured uh, Cat and uh, made him be quiet, you know, had the guns on him, what have you. And as soon as I could see the, the other, uh, the real squad sleeping, they assassinated all of them. And one of the, it was a black squad, by the way, mm. uh, which they had those, uh, led by a, a white captain. Mm. And uh, the white captain wanted to shoot Cat also, but one of the soldiers talked him out of it. He's harmless, uh, might as well let him go. That's why we down here, you know, fighting this war and all that kind of stuff. So the captain did that, he let him go. Well, Cat was devastated. He mm -hmm. failed in his mission to protect Cletus. And uh, so once he kind of got over the initial shot, you know, what do I do after the Yank squad left? Well, he found a little place he could bury him. The Yank squad destroyed all the weapons, except they did not find Cat's bow and arrows and quiver. Neither did they find his knives. He carried a 14-inch Arkansas toothpick or a Bowie knife, uh, which was unusual. And previously, the blacksmith had made him throwing knives. That was one of, another one of his talents. He was great at throwing the knives. They didn't find that because it was all the wood pile got covered him up, what have you. So Cat, Cat sets out to avenge Cleveland's. So he chased them down and caught them and one or two at a time, and uh, he eliminated that squad except for the soldier that saved his life, and they became friends. Mm. So that, that was the way the book opened, that, that, that scene. So they get back to the plantation, and a, a Yank uh, company had come through there, and they had burned the plantation and killed uh, Cletus' daddy. And Cap's mother. Yeah. Well, those are the only two people that died because they, they got word they were coming and they refused, those two refused to run. And now all the slaves, they hid in the woods. They hid the animals and the mules and the horses in the woods. And uh, so Cap and Rufus, you know, they ride up and there's nobody there. The plantation house and the barns are burned down. And uh, once they stopped, then, you know, one of the a former slave, Uncle Mose, he stepped out from behind a big tree and greeted him and everything. And then they got all the slaves that were hidden, you know, to come on in. Now, the, the uh, plantation owner, William Sheffield, he was one of those that made plans to take everyone west because he knew the South was going to win the war. But he planned to give them the freedom papers out there, but he got killed. 
And uh, so they needed someone to take them west. Now, everybody there was, you know, African-American except one person. William's sister happened to be visiting, uh, Lily, Miss Lily. And they took her out and hit her too, so they saved her life. And uh, you know, she, at the beginning of the book, was a classic Southern belle. And uh, so they, they taught Cat into leading them west. They had the big Conestoga wagons that, that, that uh, William Sheffield had bought. And uh, they had the gold that he had been hoarding to support to finance the trip out there. And so anyway, they agreed, or, or Cat agreed, and uh, it got to thinking, uh, you know, we, we will be a group of black people and we're going to face some antagonistic white people. And, you know, we don't want to get in a running battle, you know, every day of the week. So they talked Miss Lily into riding in the first wagon and let her deal with these antagonistic white people that wanted to do whatever they wanted to do. So she became a force there and uh, I mean she told them all that I, I'm just I'm I'll be along you know there's some gold that I can help with but I will represent you to the, these white people and if I have to tell them that you know all of you work for me or what have you we'll, we'll do that and none of it's true but we'll do that to avoid some problems so that began their journey and I don't know how far you want me to go but um, amazing it's an amazing story it feels so real that it's hard to believe that it's fiction. Um, yeah. yeah, because all of the characters, all of the situations, all of the relationships, all of the scenarios feel like, you know, it's a true story. It feels like a piece of history we're reliving. How do you think you were able to accomplish that, that, that sense of realism in the story? Well, one of the things I kept thinking about is plausible, the word plausible. Uh, you know, I can't say any of these things happened, but could they have happened? Right. And that was the thing. Yes, they could have. If you had the same circumstances, it could have happened. And see, the people, one, one of the things that I think helped make it real, the characters, I know you got to be careful with this, but the characters in the story, I knew them. <laughs> I grew up with them. Right, right. And some of them are composites. Uh, yeah. of, like Cat is a composite of two men that I respected a great deal, particularly when I was a teenager and later. Uh, but I knew him, and I think that made it real to me. But yeah, he would have done that, and he'd have done it that way. <laughs> right. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, very, very, very cool. And I guess that's why it feels real, because you borrowed from real-life characters that you know right. and then put them in historical settings, um, which gave it a feeling of authenticity, which is what makes the novel grip gripping, for sure. Um, I think it's really, really terrific. Have you envisioned this as a movie, perhaps, or a TV series? Uh, yeah, either or both. <laughs> Yeah, I, I do think it has that that potential, and uh, I've had some little elevator pitches with producers, and so we're kind of moving along a little bit in that direction. Uh, I probably I, I, let me back up if I could and, and throw this in. Mm -hmm. When I was uh, probably halfway through or so writing uh, Bad Cat Jones, my wife and I took a trip, mm -hmm. and we went the exact path that the caravan in the book went. Mm. Uh, I mean, we drove it. I mean, exactly as close as you can get on the road. But we drove it. We drove out to uh, to Dallas. We cut down to Fort Stockton. Then we went north up through uh, New Mexico and into Colorado. And even though we lived in New Mexico nine years, we saw parts of New Mexico I didn't never dreamed existed. Wow. <laughs> there were some really neat things out there. And the path, by the way, up uh, from Fort Stockton, uh, the way it's said in the book, it was about uh, six months before uh, the uh, the Good Night Trail, mm -hmm. the Loving Good Night group went up, and and then that exact trail is known as the Good Night Loving Trail, even today. Uh, but we put we put the caravan there first. So amazing. <laughs> so that's cool that you recreated this fictional journey, which really isn't fictional. You know, slaves did take it, and then. I imagine, and that's the wonder, I think, of the Old West, a lot of it had not changed, right? 
uh, oh, the, the terrain and everything? No, yeah, the it, terrain, it, it, the uh, land, yeah. Yes, yes, very similar. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I, the, the target that I set up before I saw it was uh, the Comanche National Grasslands that are there in southeastern uh, Colorado. And I had seen other grasslands, the National Grasslands, and they had all this lush grass, you know, knee high and everything. And I thought, well, man, that'll be the same way. You know, <laughs> it was not the same way. It, it was just, it was not lush grass. Uh, I wouldn't right. call it a grassland. But, gotcha. and you know, Mr. Crawford, another thing, if, if I had it to do again, uh, I, I would use a different name for the book. I mean, Bad Cat Jones is is the uh, it's the name of the book. It's it's the character and everything, but I probably would have named it Journey to Freedom mm. because the whole story that's what that's really about, and the subsequent follow up books are about how they develop their community and they call it Freedom Town. Mm. Uh, it's, that's not used in Bad Cat Jones, but it's used in the subsequent books. Uh, yeah. the, the homesteads that they, they got when they got out there. But it's how they built it and grew it and, and survived and all that stuff. Tell us about the series. How many books are in the series? Uh, currently, there's eight published, and we have two more that are... We have polished manuscripts for two more, but we're holding those, and they'll be published later this year and perhaps one in early uh, 25. Great. So there's 10. And then <laughs> we skipped forward to current times and wrote another seven book series that are all published. Uh, and it's their descendants. We picked out a couple of them and it's the descendants of a couple of the people in, uh, in the first series. It's amazing. So, so you have books. about 15 or so books out there that all came from the one book, Bad Cat Jones in one shape or form or another. Exactly. In a few months, it, it, it'll be an even 17. Amazing. And I'm toying with writing one more in the series, <laughs> but we'll see. That's so great. 17. So this was born out of the pandemic. This was born out of having some time. I know you thought about it for a lot of years, but yeah. you had a little time on your hands during that lockdown and you like put it to good use by writing this Bad Cat Jones uh, first book. Yeah. Well, yes, that's exactly right. My, my lovely bride... It kept nudging me, you know, gently nudging me. You know how they do yeah, uh, exactly. to write the book. And uh, at the time, you know, what I was doing, you know, I'd take the, you know, the big cloth grocery bags and go to the library and fill them up. And bring mm -hmm. it home, read them all, and, you know, then do it yeah. again. And put, that was started to get a little bit old, and she started nudging and so forth. But the, the really the first step, I think it's be okay to talk about this briefly, the, the first step in, in getting back to writing or in, into this kind of writing uh, began in, in kind of a, a different ballpark. Uh, we lost our 22-year-old son back in 96. And unbeknownst to him or us, he had fathered a child. Mm. And when the child was 19, mm. he found us. <laughs> wow. Well, yeah. So that's quite a blessing, to, right? Oh, absolute blessing, yeah. Real blessing. I mean, he almost came back into your life at the same age your son left you. Just, yep. And looks just like him. Amazing. <laughs> same Amazing. mannerisms. I mean, it's been great. It's been great. They live in Mississippi. But see, he did not grow up, you know, around our family. He knew none of these family stories. And I, we noticed when we're talking about something, well, he was all ears. Right. And then I got to think, we have two other granddaughters. And I got to thinking, you know, I should I should write up those little anecdotal stories, like campfire stories that he would have never heard. And like our, our grandgirls that are younger, uh, they know us grandparents only as old folks. <laughs> they didn't know us when we were young and vibrant and everything. Right. So that was actually my first effort. I sat down and wrote a, a little document I call Remembrances. And uh, that most of them were like a half page or a third page, you know, campfire story, some out a page or so. But I have almost 900 of those stories. Easy. Uh, and, and put them together and, and really for the grandkids. Uh, 
they may never read it, but I mean, they'll find out who we were when we were younger. <laughs> so that got my creative juices kind of flowing. And, and uh, then my wife bought me that, these yellow books, uh, Fiction Writing for Dummies. And <laughs> I didn't read it at first. And I think it's okay to say this. It's actually a good book, but I started writing first. Right. And I, again, I was about the third or halfway through, and I read I read it. And if I'd have read it first, I'd never start. <laughs> right, exactly. It scared me to death. Exactly. <laughs> it's like, well, it's sort of like the instruction manuals. Most of us men cast them aside when we get them, right? Yeah, but I did learn some stuff from it. Yeah. But again, if I had not written a word, I probably never would have. So. Right, right. Well, that's amazing. Well, we're glad you began your writing career. We're glad that this story has developed so um it, it's extremely real it's extremely entertaining it's um extremely dramatic uh it's a great great tale that you won't forget that hopefully hollywood is listening and uh turns this into a movies a series of movies because i think that's how it would work best the name of the book we've been primarily focused on today is Bad Cat Jones, Former Slaves Pioneering Journey West. It's written by a terrific man, a terrific author, and one of my favorite guests, Danny Ray Arnold. It is a captivating tale that chronicles the perilous journey of former slaves seeking a better life in Colorado after the Civil War. And if you love this book, you're in luck. There are multiple sequels. Uh, that follow. Um, and uh, I think you will enjoy them all. Danny Ray, thank you so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. Thank you for having me. It's been fun. It's been fun for me too. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your insight. To the folks at home, I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time this time. Until next time, on Spotlight.